All right, so today we're going to be looking at activity 14, dealing with points of concurrency in your triangles. There are going to be four different ones that we're going to look at today. And the way that the springboard book has you work through them, they have you develop and draw them, and they go into a lot of detail with each of these. And for time's sake this year, we are going to condense it into one lesson today with all four of them. And so it's going to be a lot of information, a lot of new terms that we've got to look at. But we're going to start off looking at what is a point of concurrency. So a point of concurrency is a point where three or more lines intersect. And so this red point right here is an example of a point of concurrency. We have three lines that intersect in that point. So the first part that we're going to look at is the circumcenter. And so before we get to the circumcenter, we have to go over perpendicular bisectors. So a perpendicular bisector of a triangle is going to be perpendicular to and intersecting the side of a triangle at the midpoint. So we're going to have a triangle here, and we're going to say that's the midpoint. I'm going to show on my triangle that it's the midpoint by saying that those two segments are congruent to each other with my little tick marks. And so it bisects it, it cuts it in half, it intersects at the midpoint, and it is perpendicular. So that means it intersects at a right angle. So that would be an example of one perpendicular bisector. When you draw all three of your perpendicular bisectors, you create the circumcenter. So the point of concurrency for all of your perpendicular bisectors, so where your three perpendicular bisectors intersect, is called the circumcenter. Your circumcenter is the center of the circumscribed circle. So if you have a circle where you have a triangle on the inside, that circle is considered to be circumscribed about the triangle. So that's the circle that's going around the triangle. So wherever the center of my circle is here, that is where my circumcenter is going to end up for my triangle. It's going to be the center of that circle. So depending on which type of triangle you have, your circumcenter may be inside, outside, or on the triangle. So inside means somewhere inside of the sides of the triangle. Outside means outside of the sides of the triangle. On the triangle means that it is on top of one of the sides. So your circumcenter, if it is an acute triangle, is going to be inside of the triangle. So that's where they have it drawn on that figure. If you have a right triangle, it is on the triangle, and specifically it is on the midpoint of the hypotenuse, right there. Or if you have an obtuse triangle, it is going to be outside of the circle, and it's going to be opposite the obtuse angle. So if this is our obtuse angle, the circumcenter is going to be over here somewhere. So since it is going to be the center of your circle, what that means is that it is going to be the same distance from every vertex. It is equal distance from each vertex. So this distance and that distance and that distance is all going to be the same thing. And that's because those are all a radius of the circle. Same thing here. This distance to that distance and that distance are all going to be the same. And then the same idea, these three distances are all going to be the same. So when you're looking at the circumcenter, it's always equal distance to each vertex. So here is a better drawing of the circumcenter. So you have your red triangle. They show that each of your sides is bisected because you have the tick marks. And they show that you have lines that are, they're black lines that are very faint that are intersecting each side at a right angle. And then the green is showing from the circumcenter to the vertices of your triangle is going to be the same distance. So that's your circumcenter. Now looking at the end center. So an angle bisector of your triangle is a line that cuts the angle 
your vertex into two congruent angles. We talked about angle bisectors before. So we're not going to use a protractor or a ruler or a compass or anything to draw all of these. We're just going to eyeball it, kind of give a rough idea of what an angle bisector looks like. So we're trying to make it so that these two angles are congruent. So that's about what an angle bisector looks like. When you draw all three of them, you create the end center. So the point of concurrency for your angle bisectors is called the end center. The end center is going to be the center of the inscribed circle. So an inscribed circle is a circle that's inside of your triangle. So if I have a triangle and I have a circle inside of it, the end center is going to be at the center of that inscribed circle. This end center is always somewhere inside of the triangle. This circle that I drew, this inscribed circle is inside of the triangle. 100% inside, and so the end center is going to have to be inside of the triangle, and it's always inside of the triangle. The end center is equal distance to each side. So if I go to each side, it's always going to be the same distance away. So on the left is one example where they drew the angle bisectors, and as you can see, each of your angles have those have two marks, those have one tick marks, these have three, showing that your angles are all three cut into congruent angles. And so where those three lines overlap or intersect, that's the point of concurrency, and that is called the end center. And then on the right, they added the circle, the inscribed circle. And so I'm going to draw some new lines because if you look at where this line continues, that's not where it touches the side. It's actually going to touch the side and it's going to be perpendicular. And those three lines that I drew are all perpendicular and the same length from the end center. So here's another figure. So what you see here, those blue lines are your angle bisectors. And then those green lines are the ones that are the distance from the end center to the sides. And like I said just a second ago, they are perpendicular. So now let's look at the third one, dealing with the orthocenter. So an altitude of a triangle is a segment from a vertex of the triangle that is perpendicular to the opposite side of the triangle. Another word for an altitude is a height. It's always perpendicular to the base, so an altitude is going to be perpendicular. So you're going to start here and then go perpendicular. The other one that we looked at that was perpendicular is the perpendicular bisector, where it cuts the side in half and is perpendicular. So the difference, this side over here and this side are not necessarily the same length. It's possible that they could be, but they don't have to be. So if I were to draw the perpendicular bisector and the altitude in the same figure, they are both right angles, but the altitude has to go through a vertex. It starts at a vertex, and the perpendicular bisector has to go through the midpoint. It has to start at the midpoint. So those are the differences between your altitude and your perpendicular bisector. Your altitudes have to go from a vertex. Your perpendicular bisectors have to go from the midpoint. So when you have your three altitudes drawn, you create the orthocenter. So the point of concurrency for the orthocenter I mean, for the altitude is the orthocenter. So, your orthocenter could be inside, outside, or on the triangle. So, if you have an acute triangle, your orthocenter will be on the inside. If you have a right triangle, it's going to be on the triangle and it's on a specific spot. It is at your right angle. So, wherever your right angle is, it's at that vertex. And then, if it is an obtuse, triangle, it's going to be outside of the triangle. 
So that's your ortho center. Here's another picture showing all three of them drawn. So this dot in the middle is the ortho center. Now we're going to look at the centroid. So a median of a triangle is a segment that goes from a vertex to the midpoint of the opposite side of the triangle. So I'm going to say this point here is the midpoint of this side. And so this blue line that I just drew is the midpoint. Now there was another one that went from the midpoint, and that is the perpendicular bisector. But it has to be perpendicular. So the midpoint and the perpendicular bisector both start at the midpoint, but the difference is that the midpoint has to go to a vertex and the perpendicular bisector has to be perpendicular. So when you draw your three medians, the point of concurrency for your medians is called the centroid. So a couple of things about the centroid. It is always inside of the triangle. It is also called the center of gravity. And the reason for that, the centroid is where your figure would balance. So if you were to take a triangle and cut it out of some material that's not going to flop over, it's like paper would flop over. So if you cut it out of wood, maybe cardboard, maybe aluminum foil, maybe not aluminum foil, but maybe some kind of metal, um, and you found where the centroid was, you drew the medians and where they intersected is the centroid, you would be able to balance that triangle at that point. So that's why it's called the center of gravity. So we've got this longer segment is two thirds of the median, the shorter segment is one third of the median, and the shorter segment is one half of the longer segment. And without looking at some numbers, those kind of get a little bit lost. People look at them, and they're like, I just see fractions and I don't know what I'm doing with. So we're going to look at some examples in just a second to go over those a little bit more in detail. So here is another drawing for your centroid. As you can see, each of your three sides is cut in half. And so that is what would create your centroid. So let's look at a couple of examples. These are specifically looking at centroids. So on these, they tell us that QN is equal to 9 and P is the centroid. So if I know that this length is 9, I have two segments that are created. I have QP and I have PN. So I have QP and I also have PN. One of those is longer than the other. And on some of the figures, it's going to be easy to identify which one is longer. And sometimes it's not. But on this one, hopefully you can tell that QP is the shorter segment. And if you look, the shorter segment is one third of the median. So that's right here. The shorter segment is one third of the median. So our median is a length of nine. So one third times nine or nine divided by three gives you three. So that means that QP equals 3. Then for PN, it is the remainder of this segment. So if the total was 9, the rest of it has to be 6. Or what is 2 thirds times 9? It is 6. Okay? So looking at number 4, if they tell you that Q to N is 21, one third of 21 is seven, and one third, or two thirds of 21 is 14. So you're gonna have seven and 14, and now you just gotta figure out which one is which. The smaller segment is PQ. So PQ is seven, leaving PN to be 14. Looking at number five, we're looking again for PN and for QP. So we know from Q to N is 30. And so one of them is one third of 30, which is 10. And one of them is two thirds of 30, which is 20. 
it may be a little harder to tell which one is the smaller or the longer side. The longer segment is always coming from the vertex. So as you can see in number three, from the vertex to the centroid is the longer segment. Again in number four, from the vertex to the centroid is the longer segment. So that means that N to P is the longer segment, so it has to be 20. So N to P is 20, leaving QP to be the smaller one, which is 10. So looking at number six, we know from Q to N is 42. So QP is the smaller segment, so one third of 42 is 14. And then two-thirds of 42 is 28. Another thing to note, 3 and 6 are related in the same way that 7 and 14 are related, in the seven way, same way that 10 and 20 are related, and in the same way that 14 and 28 are related. The smaller segment is half of the longer segment. 3 is half of 6, 7 is half of 14, 10 is half of 20, 14 is half of 28. And so that's what this last formula was saying. The shorter segment is always half of the longer segment. So once I know that, for instance, QP here on number 5, once I know that it's 10, double it to get the, tw the 20. So let's look at some other examples. If we know that DE is 5, it's the smaller segment. So double that. And that tells me that CD has to be 10, which means that the total length of CE is 15, because 5 plus 10 is 15. And if you check, 1 third of 15 gives you 5. 2 thirds of 15 gives you 10. Looking at number 8, if we know that the smaller segment is 11 here, that means that CD, double 11, gets you to 22, and CE, Double that gets you to 33. Likewise on number 9, if DE is 9, C to D, if you double that, would get you to 18. And if you add 9 and 18 together, you get CE is 27. And then for number 10, they tell us that D to E is 15. So if you double that, for CD, you get 30, and for CE, you add those two together to get a total of 45. So that's the main part of what we're going to be looking at with the centroid. So hopefully that helps you a little bit, understanding with your points of concurrency. So one thing I want to talk about, your perpendicular bisectors. Form the circumcenter. The angle bisectors form the in center. Your altitudes form the orthocenter. And then your medians form your centroid. So like I said at the beginning, it's a lot of vocab, a lot of new terms today. One thing that I have always thought of when I'm looking at these, not a way to narrow it down one to one, but at least gets you to a 50-50 shot. Hopefully you know the difference between a vowel and a consonant. Your vowels. go together. So if I know I'm looking at my angle bisectors, that means I'm either looking at the in center or the orthocenter, because I know that they both start with a vowel. I'm not going to be looking at the circumcenter or the centroid. Same way, your consonants go together. So again, doesn't get you to one to one, but it does at least help you narrow down to a 50-50 shot there. So you got to make sure that you practice understanding the different concepts of how each of them are created.
but hopefully that helps you a little bit with your points of concurrency.